What is 99U? For too long, the creative world has focused on idea generation at the expense of idea execution. As the legendary inventor Thomas Edison famously said, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. To make great ideas a reality, we must act, experiment, fail, adapt, and learn on a daily basis. 99U is Behance's effort to provide this missing curriculum for making ideas happen. Through our Webby Award, winning website, popular events, and best-selling books, we share pragmatic, action-oriented insights from leading researchers and visionary creatives. At 99U, we don't want to give you more ideas, we want to empower you to make good on the ones you've got. Preface, the world we work in today is not the world of Michelangelo, of Marie Curie, of Ernest Hemingway, or even of Paul Rand. It is a new world, empowered and entranced by the rapid-fire introduction of new technologies. A world where our metaphysical front door is always open, where anyone can whisper in our ear, where a room of one's own no longer means you're all alone. Creative minds are exceedingly sensitive to the buzz and whir of the world around them. And we now have to contend with a constant stream of chirps, pings, and alerts at all hours of the day. As these urgent demands tug us this way and that, it becomes increasingly difficult to find a centered space for creativity. Taking stock of this challenging new landscape, 99 News Manage Your Day-to-Day -day assembles insights around four key skill sets you must master to succeed. Building a rock-solid daily routine, taming your tools, finding focus in a distracted world, and sharpening your creative mind. Dedicating a chapter to each of these focus areas, we invited a group of seasoned thought leaders and creatives, Seth Godin, Stefan Sagmeister, Tony Schwartz, Gretchen Rubin, Dan Airely, Linda Stone, Stephen Pressfield, and others, to share their expertise. Our goal was to come at the problems and struggles of this new world of work from as many angles as possible, because we each have a unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and sensitivities. It is impossible to prescribe a single approach that will work for everyone. The right solution for you will always be personal an idiosyncratic combination of strategies based on your own work demands, habits, and preferences. So rather than lay out a one-size-fits-all productivity system, we provide a playbook of best practices for producing great work. Our hope is that these insights, taken together, will help you shift your mindset, recalibrate your workflow, and push more incredible ideas to completion. Jocelyn K. G. L. E. I., Editor-in-Chief, 99U. Forward, retooling for a new era of work, Scott Belsky, Founder of Behance and author of Making Ideas Happen prepare for a highly concentrated dose of insights that will prove both enlightening and uncomfortable. This was my own experience, at least. My review of the early manuscript for Manage Your Day-to-Day -day raised some glaring concerns in my own mind about my productivity and mindfulness. These new perspectives caught me off guard. I realized that much of my most valuable energy had been unknowingly consumed by bad habits. My day-to-day -day practices had devolved to a point where I was at the mercy of everything around me everything but my goals and true preferences. It was clear that I was long overdue for a self-audit of how I manage my time in a rapidly changing work environment. So much has shifted in just the last few years. My calendar and documents are now all in the cloud. I have more devices, apps, alerts, and utilities than ever before. And with the new ability to work anywhere, the outcome of the work I do has unintentionally changed. Meanwhile, I've been out there in the thick of it, working hard but never taking stock. If you keep playing without any timeouts, your game starts to slip. Of course, every great leader must face his or her demons in order to overcome them. I've always known this, but I wasn't aware of any immediate problems. But these days the demons are more insidious, they're the everyday annoyances. The little things that suck away our potential to do big things. Own the problem I've spent much of my career promoting strong business practices in the creative industry. Throughout my travels for Behance and in researching my book, Making Ideas Happen, I have spoken with countless creative people and teams about their projects and careers. With designers, writers, and entrepreneurs of all kinds, I have tried to advocate for the roll-up-your-sleeves productivity and management skills required to push ideas to fruition. My mantra has always been, it's not about ideas. It's about making ideas happen. Frequently I am asked to speak at conferences and companies about creativity. I always respond with the preliminary question, do you have ideas? The answer is almost always yes but followed by a series of obstacles like, we work in a big company and it's hard to pursue new ideas. We get overwhelmed with the day-to-day -day stuff and struggle to make progress on new stuff. Or our leadership asks for innovation but keeps getting in the way. Alas, when folks want to talk creativity, what they're really seeking is help with execution, ways to take action more effectively. Once the true problem becomes clear, the blame quickly shifts to the ecosystem. The company is either too big or too small. The management is screwing things up or it's the process that gets in the way. 
it's time to stop blaming our surroundings and start taking responsibility. While no workplace is perfect, it turns out that our gravest challenges are a lot more primal and personal. Our individual practices ultimately determine what we do and how well we do it. Specifically, it's our routine, our capacity to work proactively rather than reactively, and our ability to systematically optimize our work habits over time that determine our ability to make ideas happen. Don't just do. Retool your doing often I'll ask a great team about the last time they had a meeting to discuss how they work, aside from the occasional mention of an annual off-site. I usually get a no response. Why? Everyone's too busy doing stuff to take a pause and make some changes to how they do stuff. I've never seen a team sport without a huddle, yet we'll continue working for months, if not years, with clients and colleagues without ever taking a step back, taking stock, and making improvements to our systems. As individuals, we're even worse off. We never have off-sites with ourselves. Seldom do we stop doing what we're doing to think about how we're doing it. The biggest problem with any routine is that you do it without realizing it. Bad habits creep in, especially as we naturally acclimate to a changing work environment, and we end up working at the mercy of our surroundings. The era of reactionary workflow The biggest problem we face today is reactionary workflow. We have started to live a life pecking away at the many inboxes around us, trying to stay afloat by responding and reacting to the latest thing, emails, text messages, tweets, and so on, through our constant connectivity to each other. We have become increasingly reactive to what comes to us rather than being proactive about what matters most to us. Being informed and connected becomes a disadvantage when the deluge supplants your space to think and act. As you'll see in the discussions ahead, the shortcuts and modern marvels of work don't come without a cost. Thriving in the new era of work requires us to question the norms and so-called efficiencies that have edged their way into our day-to-day. -day. Time to optimize, we need to rethink our workflow from the ground up. Paradoxically, you hold both the problem and the solution to your day-to-day -day challenges. No matter where you work or what horrible top-down systems plague your work, your mind and energy are yours and yours alone. You can surrender your day-to-day -day and the potential of your work to the burdens that surround you. Or, you can audit the way you work and own the responsibility of fixing it. This book offers many deep and powerful insights into optimizing your day-to-day -day rhythms. You'll likely find that your work habits have drifted to accommodate your surroundings rather than to meet your preferences. Use this book as an opportunity to reassess. Take a rare pause from your incessant doing to rethink how you do what you do. Only by taking charge of your day-to-day -day can you truly make an impact in what matters most to you. I urge you to build a better routine by stepping outside of it. Find your focus by rising above the constant cacophony and sharpen your creative prowess by analyzing what really matters most when it comes to making your ideas happen. Chapter 1. Building a Rock-Solid Routine How to Give Structure Rhythm and Purpose to Your Daily Work Woody Allen once said that 80% of success is showing up. Having written and directed 50 films in almost as many years, Allen clearly knows something about accomplishment. How, when, and where you show up is the single most important factor in executing on your ideas. That's why so many creative visionaries stick to a daily routine. Choreographer Twyla Tharp gets up at the crack of dawn every day and hails a cab to go to the gym, a ritual she calls her trigger moment. Painter Ross Blechner reads the paper, meditates, and then gets to the studio by 8 a.m. so that he can work in the calm quiet of the early morning. Writer Ernest Hemingway wrote 500 words a day, come hell or high water. Truly great creative achievements require hundreds, if not thousands, of hours of work. And we have to make time every single day to put in those hours. Routines help us do this by setting expectations about availability, aligning our workflow with our energy levels, and getting our minds into a regular rhythm of creating. At the end of the day, or, really, from the beginning, building a routine is all about persistence and consistency. Don't wait for inspiration, create a framework for it. Laying the groundwork for an effective routine, Mark McGinnis if you want to create something worthwhile with your life. You need to draw a line between the world's demands and your own ambitions. Yes, we all have bills to pay and obligations to satisfy. But for most of us there's a wide gray area between the have toss and want toss in our lives. If you're not careful, that area will fill up with email, meetings, and the requests of others, leaving no room for the work you consider important. A great novel, a stunning design, a game-changing piece of software, a revolutionary company. Achievements like these take time, thought, craft, and persistence. And on any given day, this effort will never appear as urgent as those four emails from client X or colleague Y asking for something that can likely wait a few hours, if not days. No one likes the feeling that other people are waiting, impatiently, for a response. At the beginning of the day, faced with an overflowing inbox, an array of voicemail messages, and the list of next steps from your last meeting, it's tempting to clear the decks before starting your own work. 
When you're up to date, you tell yourself, it will be easier to focus. The trouble with this approach is it means spending the best part of the day on other people's priorities. By the time you settle down to your own work, it could be mid-afternoon, when your energy dips and your brain slows. Oh well, maybe tomorrow will be better, you tell yourself. But tomorrow brings another pile of emails, phone messages, and to-do list items. If you carry on like this, you will spend most of your time on reactive work, responding to incoming demands and answering questions framed by other people, and you will never create anything truly worthwhile. Creative work first, reactive work second. The single most important change you can make in your working habits is to switch to creative work first, reactive work second. This means blocking off a large chunk of time every day for creative work on your own priorities. With the phone and email off, I used to be a frustrated writer, making this switch turn me into a productive writer. Now, I start the working day with several hours of writing. I never schedule meetings in the morning, if I can avoid it. So whatever else happens, I always get my most important work done, and looking back, all of my biggest successes have been the result of making this simple change. Yet there wasn't a single day when I sat down to write an article, blog post, or book chapter without a string of people waiting for me to get back to them. It wasn't easy, and it still isn't particularly when I get phone messages beginning I sent you an email two hours ago. By definition, this approach goes against the grain of others' expectations and the pressures they put on you. It takes willpower to switch off the world, even for an hour. It feels uncomfortable, and sometimes people get upset. But it's better to disappoint a few people over small things than to surrender your dreams for an empty inbox. Otherwise, you're sacrificing your potential for the illusion of professionalism. The building blocks of a great daily routine, of course, it's all well and good to say buckle down and ignore pesky requests. But how can you do so on a daily basis? Start with the rhythm of your energy levels. Certain times of day are especially conducive to focused creativity, thanks to circadian rhythms of arousal and mental alertness. Notice when you seem to have the most energy during the day and dedicate those valuable periods to your most important creative work. Never book a meeting during this time if you can help it, and don't waste any of it on administrative work. Use creative triggers. Stick to the same tools, the same surroundings, even the same background music, so that they become associative triggers for you to enter your creative zone. Here's how it works for Stephen King. There are certain things I do if I sit down to write. I have a glass of water or a cup of tea. There's a certain time I sit down, from 8 to 8.30, somewhere within that half hour every morning. I have my vitamin pill and my music, sit in the same seat, and the papers are all arranged in the same places. The cumulative purpose of doing these things the same way every day seems to be a way of saying to the mind, you're going to be dreaming soon one managed to-do list creep. Limit your daily to-do list. A three times three post-it is perfect. If you can't fit everything on a list that size, how will you do it all in one day? If you keep adding to your to-do list during the day, you will never finish, and your motivation will plummet. Most things can wait till tomorrow, so let them capture every commitment. Train yourself to record every commitment you make somewhere that will make it impossible to forget. This will help you respond to requests more efficiently and make you a better collaborator. More important, it will give you peace of mind when you are confident that everything has been captured reliably. You can focus on the task at hand. Establish hard edges in your day. Set a start time and a finish time for your workday, even if you work alone. Dedicate different times of day to different activities, creative work, meetings, correspondence, administrative work, and so on. These hard edges keep tasks from taking longer than they need to and encroaching on your other important work. They also help you avoid workaholism, which is far less productive than it looks. A truly effective routine is always personal, a snug fit with your own talent and inclinations. So experiment with these building blocks and notice which combination gives you the best foundation for doing your best work. You'll know it's effective when your daily schedule starts to feel less like a mundane routine and more like a creative ritual. Mark McGuinness is a London-based coach for creative professionals. He works with clients all over the world and consults for creative companies. He is the author of Resilience, Facing Down Rejection and Criticism on the Road to Success and a columnist for 99U. Harnessing the power of frequency, Gretchen Rubin we tend to overestimate what we can do in a short period and underestimate what we can do over a long period, provided we work slowly and consistently. Anthony Trollope the 19th century writer who managed to be a prolific novelist while also revolutionizing the British postal system. Observed, a small daily task, if it be really daily, will beat the labors of a spasmodic Hercules. Over the long run, the unglamorous habit of frequency fosters both productivity and creativity. As a writer, I work every single day, including weekends, holidays, and vacations. Usually I write for many hours during a day, though sometimes it might be a stint as short as 15 minutes and I never skip a day. 
I found that this kind of frequent work makes it possible to accomplish more. With greater originality, for several reasons. Frequency makes starting easier. Getting started is always a challenge. It's hard to start a project from scratch, and it's also hard each time you re-enter a project after a break. By working every day, you keep your momentum going. You never have time to feel detached from the process. You never forget your place, and you never need to waste time reviewing your work to get back up to speed or reminding yourself what you've already done. Because your project is fresh in your mind, it's easy to pick up where you left off. Frequency keeps ideas fresh. You're much more likely to spot surprising relationships and to see fresh connections among ideas. If your mind is constantly humming with issues related to your work, when I'm deep in a project, everything I experience seems to relate to it in a way that's absolutely exhilarating. The entire world becomes more interesting. That's critical because I have a voracious need for material, and as I become hyper-aware of potential fodder, ideas pour in. By contrast, Working sporadically makes it hard to keep your focus. It's easy to become blocked, confused, or distracted, or to forget what you were aiming to accomplish. Frequency keeps the pressure off. If you're producing just one page, one blog post, or one sketch a week, you expect it to be pretty darn good. And you start to fret about quality. I knew a writer who could hardly bring herself to write. When she did manage to keep herself in front of her laptop for a spate of work, she felt enormous pressure to be brilliant. She evaluated the product of each work session with an uneasy and highly critical eye. She hadn't done much work, so what she did accomplish had to be extraordinarily good. Because I write every day, no one day's work seems particularly important. I have good days and I have bad days. Some days, I don't get much done at all. But that's okay, because I know I'm working steadily. My consequent lack of anxiety puts me in a more playful frame of mind and allows me to experiment and take risks. If something doesn't work out, I have plenty of time to try a different approach. Frequency sparks creativity. You might be thinking, having to work frequently, whether or not I feel inspired, will force me to lower my standards. In my experience, the effect is just the opposite. Often folks achieve their best work by grinding out the product. Creativity arises from a constant churn of ideas, and one of the easiest ways to encourage that fertile froth is to keep your mind engaged with your project. When you work regularly, inspiration strikes regularly. Frequency nurtures frequency. If you develop the habit of working frequently, it becomes much easier to sit down and get something done even when you don't have a big block of time. You don't have to take time to acclimate yourself. I know a writer married to a painter, and she told me, we talk about the 10-minute rule. If our work is going well, we can sit down and get something good done in 10 minutes. Frequency allows us to make use of these short windows of time. On a related note, frequency fosters productivity. It's no surprise that you're likely to get more accomplished if you work daily. The very fact of each day's accomplishment helps the next day's work come more smoothly and pleasantly. Nothing is more satisfying than seeing yourself move steadily toward a big goal. Step by step, you make your way forward. That's why practices such as daily writing exercises or keeping a daily blog can be so helpful. You see yourself do the work, which shows you that you can do the work. Progress is reassuring and inspiring. Panic and then despair set in when you find yourself getting nothing done day after day. One of the painful ironies of work life is that the anxiety of procrastination often makes people even less likely to buckle down in the future. Frequency is a realistic approach. Frequency is helpful when you're working on a creative project on the side, with pressing obligations from a job or your family. Instead of feeling perpetually frustrated that you don't have any time for your project, you make yourself make time. Every day. If you do a little bit each day, you can get a lot done over the course of months and years. Also, it's true that frequency doesn't have to be a daily frequency. What's most important is consistency. The more widely spaced your work times, however, the less you reap all of these benefits. The opposite of a profound truth is usually also true. While there are many advantages to frequency over the long term, sometimes it's fun to take a boot camp approach, to work very intensely for a very short period of time. In making comics, Scott McCloud recommends what he calls the 24-hour comic. Draw an entire 24-page comic book in a single 24-hour period. No script, no preparation. Once the clock starts ticking, it doesn't stop until you're done. Great shock therapy for the creatively blocked. I love plugging along in my work bit by bit, but occasionally it's even more useful to take a big, ambitious step. By tackling more instead of less, I enjoy a surge of energy and focus. I have a long list of secrets of adulthood, the lessons I've learned as I've grown up, such as. It's the task that's never started that's more tiresome. The days are long, but the years are short and always leave plenty of room in the suitcase. One of my most helpful secrets is, what I do every day matters more than what I do once in a while. Day by day, we build our lives, and day by day, 
we can take steps toward making real the magnificent creations of our imaginations. Gretchen Rubin is the author of the bestsellers Happier at Home and The Happiness Project. Accounts of her experiences test driving ancient wisdom, scientific studies, and lessons from popular culture about happiness. On her blog, she reports on her daily adventures in happiness.